Hi, I'm Orr. I'll be talking today about AB experiments and how it's just a little bit harder than a color change. So hopefully through the course of this, you'll understand better how to run experiments. So out of curiosity, how many people here are software engineers? How many people have run an AB experiment before? How many people want to run an AB experiment? Great, so this is definitely relevant to everybody. So a little bit of background. I'm here from Yelp, and we connect people with great local businesses. So as part of that, everything that we do is very much user-centric and user-focused, right? So we have a lot of users over the last 10 years that have contributed a lot of content to our website. You know, we have millions of reviews, we've got millions of different data points that we can start to use, and from that we can start to use data to understand better how the user experiences the website and how they are going to interact with it in the future. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone is using it, and not everybody is actually running experiments on Yelp, right? So my team is a transaction platform team, and we are the ones that enable users to directly order food on Yelp which is maybe not a feature that all of you are familiar with and why we're really focusing on trying to continue to grow this and get more people excited about this. So this is still something that not everyone is using on Yelp and it's not what Yelp is exactly known for, right? So we want to continue growing this area. So this is something exciting for all of us though, right? Because this connects users in a whole new manner with their local businesses, right? You're able to then directly interact with the business and by actually ordering food. And at the same time, it actually generates revenue. So everybody is happy about this from all sorts of points. Right? You get food. Oh, that goes backwards. So let's start with this. This is Wing Wings. Wing Wings is a local San Francisco delicacy. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with this, but this is the part that my team has added. And that's exactly how you're able to order food on Yelp. It all starts with a button click. So everything that we're considering is that exact user interaction to start this flow. If you don't, whoa, okay. That is a little too much for me, sorry. So everything that you do is gonna start with clicking on that button. And if you don't click on that button, then it's hard for us to know what we're gonna do and how you're able to even order food, right? So what we wanna start thinking about is how do we get users to click that button more? Now, my team is made up primarily of back-end engineers. I'm a back-end engineer myself. So about a year ago, we started to investigate what would it mean for us to run an A-B experiment? Because we didn't know. Do we have enough traffic? Do we have enough users? How long does an experiment take? What are the changes that you can do? Is this gonna take too long? Can we not prioritize feature work? Or is our infrastructure gonna get impacted by all this? Are we gonna need to invest in new technologies? These are all like a whole host of questions that we had to think about. And we didn't have the answers right away. And while there may be experiments running at Yelp, otherwise, we didn't think that those are exactly going to match our use case. Or maybe they would. And that's what we want to start to find out. So this talk is really going to talk about how we ran a set of three experiments and how we saw some great impact from them and what the steps were that we did from running those experiments. And hopefully from that, you'll understand better how to run an A-B experiment. So as I said, we ran a, a series of three experiments, and these were pre three pretty standard experiments to run for an A-B experiment. And out of that, we saw a total of 15% increase in revenue. So you can imagine, hey, 15% is a pretty big number, and all I did was run three experiments. From and since then, it's been a year ago, of course we're continuing to run more, but this is what it takes. You do a small investigation to learn about this sort of impact, and A-B experiments really is the route to a lot of much larger success. So with that, let's talk about what is an A-B experiment. So, this is the easy part, right? An A-B experiment is any time you're gonna check how a variation does, an A and a B. All right, so when should you run an A-B experiment? Well, any time you can come up with that hypothesis question. This is really applying the scientific method to a little bit of the process that we do as an engineer, right? Can you come up with a question? Is green gonna do better than orange in click-through rate? That's something I could test. Is orange gonna do better than green? That's another question. Are neither of these better than each other? That's something we can think about. Now, of course, why? Well, what we want is now data to be able to drive our decisions. Before, a lot of times that you're making these sorts of color changes, it might be brand, it might be unnecessary, you didn't have a good reason for why you're making that change. So now, by running this A-B experiment, not only would you be able to very clearly say, hey, green is better than orange, or hey, green does worse than orange, we should not make that change, you'll be able to give data to provide a reason for why you made that decision. And you'll be able to look back at that data later on if you want to think about this decision sometime in the future. Now how? 
how do you run an A-B experiment? And this is really going to be the meat of this talk. Let's go through the steps. So first thing you're going to do is generate the hypothesis. That's going to be the question that's going to be the basis for this entire experiment. What are we testing here? If you don't have a clear idea of what you're testing, it doesn't matter what you measure. You might be measuring how long something takes. It might be the wrong thing, because that's not the metric that you're concerned about. Right? Next, you'll always want to get some necessary data. So that could be user's click-through rate for a button. That's the first thing you're going to need for a baseline. How many users see that button even? So what's your weekly traffic? What's your user process? Right? What are some other secondary metrics that are matter for this? Right? So these are all the sort of data that you're going to need to gather beforehand. After that, you're going to need to implement this. Code doesn't magically happen, right? Somebody has to take the time and write it up. Somebody has to implement this. And of course, you want to test this to make sure that your experiment is going to be a success from the beginning. Next, you'll want to roll out the experiment, right? You have to get this out to production, see how it behaves, make sure everything's OK. Finally, you'll wait a little bit of time, and then you'll be able to analyze your results. Great. So with that, we come to our first case study, greener pastures. So step one, we're going to generate a hypothesis. So we came to our PM, and we asked them this pretty simple, OK, we want to learn about running an A-B experiment. So let's start with something very basic, and let's think about what do you want to test. Now, pretty standard A-B experiment is color button change, right? Knowing what the color of your button is and changing that to something different. So let's go back to Wing Wings. Remember, this is our widget. So that's the button that we're going to change, OK? That makes sense. Right now, it looks like this. It's orange. So you can imagine, hey, there's a whole host of other colors we could choose from. We can make this be bright red and just flashing constantly. And I'm sure a lot of users will get a lot of attention on this. You're going to see people are going to have to look at something that's flashing in their face. That is not exactly going to be necessarily the best experience. Right? You don't want to just make a change absentmindedly, though. right? We want to actually change something and make this be a color that we're going to be able to drive the amount of users that want to interact with this widget. So what we're going to do is, I think I've kind of hinted at this, we're going to hint, go to green. We're going to experiment to see whether green is a better color than orange for a button color. Now, that sounds like a good idea. Green is the color of success. Green's the color of money. That's what we want, so green it is. OK, that's a good first step. Next, we're going to need it to gather some necessary data. Okay? We're going to want to go through and find out what the current click-through rate is on that button. How many users that see the page, which has a button, then go on and click it? And that gets us a baseline conversion. Okay? Next, we're going to want to know the weekly traffic, because we're going to want to do some sample size calculations and be able to understand how long this experiment is going to run for. Right? If this is going to run for three months, then maybe we should actually not prioritize this experiment. Maybe instead we want to do some other feature work. That sounds like a pretty good idea. If this is only going to take a week or a day, then of course this sounds like a great thing to do right now. And these are the sort of questions that you want to ask yourself at the beginning of an experiment. Now what else could we measure and get data for? Well, one of the things that A-B experiments let you do is know exactly the effect of your change on other things on that page. We could then measure the impact on ads click-through rate on that page. If we made it bright red and flashing, I bet we're going to get a lot more users who are not clicking on anything on that page just because they got that annoying experience. Right? These are the sort of measurements that we can tell exactly are being done by our experiment. So those are potential other things. Well, we think that green is not going to be something that's such a nuisance. So we're not going to start measuring every single thing on that second page because we think it's going to have a very minor impact on these other secondary metrics. So our primary metric is the click-through rate. So how many users who land on a page and then click on start order. And our primary secondary metric here is going to be completing that order. So what I mean is you clicked start order, but then you actually added an item to your card and you checked out. Because what we want to make sure is that you are not only clicking on it because, hey, you saw that button that you never saw before, but you actually clicked on it with the intent of ordering food. Right? So we want to get more users with intent through this funnel. So that's a very good secondary metric for us to measure. All right. Great. Now we've got to do a little bit of math. We want to get some sample size calculations for understanding how many users are going to need to see each variation for this to be a statistically significant experiment. So let me explain that a little bit. So minimum detectable effect is actually the effect that you believe your experiment is going to have. 
So we're going to say that we want to see a 5% relative increase in click-through rate for this experiment to be a success. Okay? So if you started with 10% click-through rate and you want to see a 5% relative effect, then the click-through rate of a green button has to be 12%, right? Very, very reasonable. You need to measure your baseline conversion, which we just did. Then you're going to use statistical power. So 95% is actually higher than the industry average, but we want to do this so that way we really understand how to run an experiment. And we're going to use a standard, industry standard level of 5% for our significance. We crunch some numbers, and we get that 300,000 users are going to need to be in each variation. So OK, that's just a number now. We have no context. So if we say that we have about a million users a week who see this page, or a million users a day who see this page, that's how long this experiment is going to take. It'll take less than a week or less than a day. Those are the calculations that you're not able to make based on this. So hey, this experiment is good. We know what we're going to need to see in terms of number of users to see each button. And we can run this. This is not going to take too long. Great. Now we can implement. And the first thing we're going to want to make sure is that we actually implement both. Because what we want to keep is actually a status control group for us to test this against. Every time you run an A-B experiment, it's an A and B. You want to keep your A group still. That control is going to be able to tell you what the baseline is as it changes throughout the week. With food in particular, like there's a lot of seasonality in the way people order. People during December are actually ordering a lot more because they want to get food. They don't want to leave the house because it's cold. In the summer, people go out. Seasonality matters, so keeping your control group is very important for us. So we're going to keep 50% going to each one of these variations, and we want to make sure that we can see that. Now, this could have easily have been 90, 10, anything else, but we, we believe that the new variation is not high risk, so let's get this as many eyes as possible. Now, in terms of actually coding this up, quarks are your friend. Now, you can imagine there's a lot of experiments that get run at Yelp. Search has something, ads has something, we have something. And for every user's request, imagine that they get bucketed per request into a different control group for each experiment. So there's a giant dictionary in terms of all the experiments are currently running and which one a user is currently in. Now, in terms of dictionary lookups and everything, you don't want to do that every time you want to check, hey, which experiment are you in? Which group of an experiment are you in? Which variation of that should you be shown? So we're going to use quarks, so that way you assume that the rest of the code is going to look at it, and you only need to do one time a check in terms of which experiment you're in. So pretty simple. This also gives us a way of setting default behavior, right? So if you see here, now we've made a check to see what is a, the cohort that you're in. If you're in status quo, you'll see orange. Otherwise, you're going to see green. OK. Now we've got to test this. Now, unit tests are not enough in terms of this. Of course, you're going to check the code itself, but you actually want to do some visual inspection. We want to make sure that that widget and that button weren't somehow getting used anywhere else on the website. Now, this makes sense. We are only measuring our particular section. If so, uh, somehow our change made a change somewhere else that we're not measuring, and that has a negative impact there, we would never know because we didn't make that change that we expected. So always scope your change to only the part that you are actually testing for. Right? And that means running through some visual inspections to make sure that no other button got changed. We don't want to turn all the buttons on Yelp to be green, unless that's exactly what our experiment is. But in our case, we're changing one button right now. And you want to make sure this is going through an entire flow. We wanted to make sure that clicking on that button didn't somehow break how you enter the rest of the flow. OK, so now we roll out the experiment. Now we're going to do this in a couple of steps. First, we're going to roll it out internally. And this is going to allow us to check that everything is testing fine, everything is visually as we expected, there are no bugs. Then we're going to go to a very small percentage of traffic. And I just mean so that way, you know, company even as big as us is still a lot smaller than the amount of users who actually use Yelp on a daily basis. So turning it on for a very short period of time to a small percentage of users, we'll check that there are no bugs still. And then right away, we're going to go to our predetermined values. So 50-50 in the case of this experiment. All right, great. Now a week passes, and we're able to analyze our results. And fantastic. We got a 5.26% relative increase, which means that green did better than orange. And it did better than the 5% that we needed for it to be statistically significant. And this is good. So you're able to go to your PM and say, good news, right? We're able to successfully run an experiment. Let's do more. We just saw that this is going to increase the amount of users, which gets us more revenue. We want more experiments. And he is super excited. Because of course, now he has other ideas of what he wants to do. 
there's lots of different experiments that he could run. And now we are enabling him. So we have a new problem now. We actually have an abundance of experiments. So already, instead of just one idea that they wanted to test out, they want to test out 100. Well, OK, OK, let's hold back a second. We just ran our first experiment. I don't think we're ready to scale to hundreds in just one day, all right? So what is the first set of experiments that you want to run next? So first thing first, we're going to need some hypothesis. We want to still make sure that we know what we're testing and getting something ready. Now, the first thing that they want to do is this. We just changed to green, but is green really the best color? Or was it that we got lucky and changed from orange, which happened to be the worst color? So we've got a few more colors now that we actually want to test out. And we're going to see a multitude of different colors and test which color actually is the best button color. OK, that's an easy experiment to follow up on our first one. But we got one more thing that we want to do. This is, again, the business page with our widget. And we're going to do something like this. The majority of users speak English or an English-based language. And that means that the way that they read a page is actually in an F shape, which looks like this. They start from the top left, and they go right and then down. And if you look, our widget falls very squarely outside of that F. Now, simple psychology means that you're getting less attention just based on the layout of the page for our widget. So what are we going to do? We're going to take the page, and we're going to do a simple layout change, and we're going to switch from the right to the left. So everything on the right, rather than just moving our one widget, is going to be moved to the left. And everything that was formerly on the left gets shifted to the right. So a layout change, OK? So those are going to be our two next experiments to run. OK. Those are good questions. We have some good ideas to see why we want to run those experiments. And we think they'll be successful. Good. Now we're in the F. So let's gather the data. And this is actually pretty easy. We're making the change to the exact same widget as before. So all of our previous data collection is exactly what we need. We know what the baseline is, because we've been measuring it for the last week with our experiment. We know the number of users. And we know exactly all the sample size calculations. Well, we do need to do a slight variation, though. Because now we're running our multiple colors with more than two cohorts, we're actually going to need to make an adjustment for the number of variations. And our alpha levels needs to change. All right? So it's a simple correction. You just divide by the number of cohorts minus one. All right? And that's great. Let's implement this. Well, we know how to build it. We did the same thing for the colors. We add a few more if statements for blue, red, dark red. And that's it. That's easy. For the layout, it's a little bit trickier. It's not just some CSS change. Now we actually need to change how the entire page is laid out. But we're going to do this in a pretty simple way. And OK, let's roll it out. Well, can anybody tell me why this seems a little weird? So it is on this, the left-hand side, but that's actually what we want. But there's a problem here. Is actually, it's left in green. We have both of our experiments on together. Not only that, you're actually able to get the entire groups of them, because we're making the change to the exact same widget for both of these experiments, which breaks fundamentally the way we were thinking of this before. Our assumptions used to be that our experiments are so far from one another in terms of the company that a search change isn't going to make a change to this widget. But now we're close enough, and we're making two experiments run on the exact same component. And that's going to make it interleave. So instead of only having an experiment that has five variation and one experiment that has two variations, if we do it this way, we're actually going to get 10 variation and have to measure both of the experiments together. And that is possible. We could run a lot more math, and we're going to be able to calculate exactly which one does best from this. But that seems like a problem. And this doesn't really scale well if we wanted to run five experiments or 10 experiments or more, right? So we could go back to our PM and tell them, hey, we have to run this one at a time. But that seems like a problem that we can actually solve, right? We don't want to be held back by just saying that we can only run one experiment per widget at a time. And we have a solution for this. And we propose something called swim lanes. So let me explain how we came to this, right? So right now, we have an experiment, right? Go back orange and green. We have a second experiment, right? It's right and left. They're currently overlaid, right? We have this problem that you're going to see both experiments at the same time. And that gets you multiplying how many variations for each one. What we want, ideally, is actually for each one of these to see separately. right? 
we want each experiment to have its own time and not be overlapped at all. So we're gonna use something like a swim lane. So a swimming pool with swim lanes has some nice advantage to it, right? Every time a swimmer is there, they're not running into the other swimmers because they stay in their own lanes. So we're gonna apply that same ideology and we're gonna pre-partition our users into lanes and then assign experiments per lane. So this way they stay for a lot of control. So think about this, right? The top, the bottom, each one of these lanes has an experiment. Users are pre-partitioned to which ones they are in total, but you can think about them there. Each one is staying in their own lane. So let's think how that looks. So let's say we have these four lanes. So the experiment one would only be for the top two lanes, with the first lane being for off, and the second one being for when it's on, and then the second experiment being for lane three and four. So if a user is in lane one at the top, they're seeing experiment one being off. They're not seeing experiment two at all because they were not into that pre-partition. That means that for them, that experiment does not exist at all. Okay, so that actually makes it so that if your user is in their first experiment, they're not seeing your second experiment at all. And now we're good again. We're able to run both of these experiments at the exact same time. Now, this, isn't, this is actually really good, right? This scales out linearly, right? Instead of having to multiply the number of variations for each experiment you want to add, you're actually only having to add them. So before, we had 10 different variations if we wanted to run these two experiments together. Now we just have seven. Not only that, it actually lets us stagger. So if you have a developer working on a first experiment and a different developer working on the second one, they're able to launch them separately at different times. You could think about this. In our first case, if we'd run those two experiments together, we would have had to launch them at the same time and end them at the same time. Otherwise, your data would have been very tricky. If you started the experiments with multiple colors for experiment one, and then halfway through, you started our layout change, we would then have to realize which part of the data got affected differently by each one. So that makes it a lot harder for analysis. Well, that's great, but we do have a little bit of a trade-off. Testing gets a little bit harder. Each one of these experiments now has a default case that you need to consider. You have to make sure that an experiment, when it's not available, is having users still get the correct default behavior. Right? That means that actually, if you look at our previous if, when I'll show you in a second, it actually broke. So what I mean, we were checking before that your cohort was equal to the status quo, which was getting set to orange. But currently, if you were in lane three or four, you're actually not getting set at all for this experiment. So your cohort could be none, right? That means that you were accidentally seeing green when you should not have been seeing any color change. You should have been seeing our default layout of orange. So that's something to remember. You always want to make sure that these if statements have the same default case, which is going to be your control group always. All right? So always check for the variant that you're, you're doing and then assign accordingly. All right? So let's roll out these two experiments. Now we have to roll out a little bit differently because we actually made an infrastructure change to run this and we want to make sure that our users are getting pre-partitioned correctly. So let's say we gave 50% of our users in our first experiment and 50 in our second. Of that, we want to make sure that you're getting properly across the board the amount that we want. So we did that, it looked good, and now we're able to analyze the results. Now green did the best. We saw this now two experiments in a row, and this is a great result. We're able to continue and say that green is the best color for our button. Now you might ask, if you look at the error bars, doesn't that dark maroon actually overlap slightly with green? And the answer is yes. But instead of wasting time running a third experiment to see whether green is actually the best overall, we're saying this is good enough. We've run two experiments and we've seen that green has been successful and we can make a product decision to say, we're not gonna run a third experiment at this time to see if we need to make another change to our color. Great, now how did layout do? Layout also did successfully, as you could imagine, right? Psychology told us that by moving things to the left for English users, it would work better and it did just that. We saw a 9.3% increase. Not only that, everything else that got shifted to the left also saw a similar increase of at least 10%, if not more. But now let's look at some of those other secondary metrics. So we saw everything that moved on the left saw an increase. What happened to things that moved to the right? And unfortunately, they of course saw a decrease. And one of those things that actually got moved to the right were some of our ads. Now that means that we it negatively impacted our ad revenue while positively impacting our platform revenue. 
So we have to now make a decision. Is this good enough or do we come back and continue experimenting? And we decided this time it's actually continuing experimenting is what we want to run for this experiment. So with that, I hope you guys now have a better understanding of how to run an A-B experiment. And now, even though it is a little harder than just a CSS color change, it's very much something that's doable and you can manage that complexity. For us, using Swimlane allow for us to run exclusively multiple experiments at the exact same time. And remember, we just ran three experiments and we saw a 15% increase. For you, it could be much greater and it can continue being a way that it can see a lot of good impact for your business. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Yeah. The concept of swim lanes, I guess it corresponds to some kind of percentage among the people who are viewing it. So each guy is going to see some combination of the color and the layout in some sense. No? no? So. so again, the question is if these kind of still have an overlap, right? So swim lanes actually are completely pre-partitioning users. So every time you are actually pre-partitioned into which experiment are you even potentially seeing at the beginning? So before you're getting assigned for an experiment into a variation, you're getting assigned into an experiment. So let's say that I'm, uh, let's say that I'm on the uh, left layer. Mm -hmm. What color would it be? You would see the base color of orange. Right. So that's the thing, right? You're always keeping your default of control group for anybody that's not in that experiment. So that way it doesn't get affected by it. Great, any other question? Sure, so by running these experiments exclusively, you're making an assumption that the, the combination of those changes is not actually better or worse, and that's true. Um, by by doing it this way, we're seeing exclusively how that one experiment is going to make a change. But then if you see that this one experiment is successful, you're then able to understand how it could impact your, and then we could run a third experiment, which is a combination of the two as an experiment. Because at that point, we could have said, oh, we're going to completely drop orange, or we're going to drop red and only do three colors rather than the five that we had. So you don't want to necessarily always do all the testing. There are infinite number of possibilities and permutations you can always change on a website. You really want to get the best thing at a time. Any other questions? Yeah. So, uh, Go ahead. I could just. Uh, so it sounds like you use uh, your primary metric. Um, did you consider using the actual value of the clip? Like if, 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 if food orders have very different values to the business, mm -hmm. So even though there is some uh, variability between the, the, the reality is that we're still considering just general opportunity. We just want to get more users in general into the funnel, and that's why we want to make sure that the funnel didn't get negatively impacted. And as long as that stayed consistent, that was fine for us. Um, it depends always on your experiment that you run and what's your measure of success. Click-through rate is still generally a very good thing to measure. Uh, so it gets a lot more complicated when you talk about like search and different signals within search. Uh, for this, this we keep it a lot more simple. Yeah. Sure. So the first thing that we did is at, we ended the experiment. Right, so we decided, okay, this is not gonna be turned on right now. So if you go to Yelp today, the layout still is what it is before. It hasn't been changed at the moment. And if we actually run more experiments later on to see a more actual nuanced variation of the layout, might be better a way of doing this.
Sure. So I, the question is, right, how do you approach when an experiment has mixed you know, signals out of it, something's negative, something's positive, and have that discussion? And that really depends on the exact case. Um, add has a way of doing revenue, so having those revenue numbers be understood, like, is there something that we can measure and add enough revenue to compensate for that at this time? Or is that something that we believe this change compensates enough for it? Gets you that conversation. Are there other, those secondary metrics that you consider to outweigh? So it starts to be, what it, is your company right now focusing for? Or what is the general like, group thing that you're looking to optimize at this time? So it really turns into, I can't give you an exact answer, and you'll, the more data you have, the better you'll be able to discuss and make good decisions based on that. Yes? Mm -hmm. Sure, so the question is, the F pattern is something that is very interesting to see, and if you haven't seen it before, how do you find out about those sorts of patterns? Um, a lot of it is reading and, and seeing more options, right? Co no, so that's actually, there's a number of different psychology uh, that you can see for that, and it's based on language. So English, you read from left to right. Other languages that read from right to left, it's an inverse of F. Um, the more you go about, talk to people, and learn about these experiments, you'll see that there's a large pattern for some things. That's why you know, color changing of a button is a very much the standard first thing that you can do as an A-B experiment. Any other questions? Yes. So if you're making them for each one, then yeah. Yep. Yeah, it really depends. So, so the question is about the percentage of swim lanes. If you're keeping a control group for each one of your experiments, that means that your control group can be overlapped between. And that could be OK. You can be OK with exactly having that, or you could just keep only one control and not need it for the second experiment if they are the same. Um, it really depends on how risky your change is. It, the riskier the change is, you might want to keep a larger control. Uh, depends on are you running an experiment for a very long period of time. Those are the kind of questions that you want to consider when you're having the sorts of how much proportion of your traffic should go to each variation of an experiment. Yes? So industry average for that is 80. We were using it for this first experiment to be able to really understand what does it mean when you change that number. Uh, since then, we've lowered it back to just 80. So the lower the number is, the more likely that you are OK with false positives. But you're saying, I'm now optimizing for being able to run more experiments quicker. Yeah, so the question is about how individual developers run A-B experiments at Yelp. So absolutely, it, every developer is pretty easy for them to set up an experiment. Um, usually the main thing is you want to have an understanding of what's the change that you're making. If you're making something that's a ba pure back-end change, oh, that, that's also a way of being able to run A-B experiment. If you're doing something that's more user-facing, the larger your intended impact, the larger your changes, or the more users are going to see, the more you'll go through a little bit of a larger process of making sure that your change actually is the best thing to do this time. Um, Long-running experiments are usually a trade-off between feature building. Uh, so it's always a good discussion to have with product about what's the current thing that we want to build on. But small experiments such as color change, we don't want to run them all the time. You don't want to just get users to see the change and be like, oh, we're not going to have anything consistent. So you only want to stage these at large times. Um, but content in a lot of terms of what our messaging is changes all the time and you'll never know. Uh, you know, a lot of things like text can be very easily played around with and you can find out how do people interact with it a little bit better. And the smaller your user base, the longer it'll take for your experiment. So the more targeted you are, that's actually sometimes a time when you don't want to run an A-B experiment because it'll take too long. No, no problem. I'd love to answer this. Mm-hmm. 
Sure. So even though I was a back-end engineer, I'm, I stepped up and started investigating how this would affect us. This is kind of to show that this is exactly something that anyone can do. I, you know, if, if somebody like me, myself, could do this, I think it's something that's easily spread out and we could clearly see the impact and the value of doing A-B experiments. Great, any other questions? Yeah, so very difficult question. Let me kind of sum it up. Um, the question's about how, what we set our power analysis to and why we set it to that, so that way we were running multiple experiments. Is that kind of correct? Yeah, there's a ton of experimentation Absolutely, so in terms of that, 5% is industry standard, so it's easy for us to stay around there. Um, a lot of what we do is really about what do we, it, think the intended impact of this. Something that's large will be a lot more risk averse. Something that's small, of course, we want to iterate on quickly and get as much information on that as possible. Um, a lot of what we've started to do is become a lot more Bayesian about this. So start thinking about how are we looking at prior models for, uh, and posterior models and see the impact over a larger user group. Um, I don't think I've prob properly answered your question. Yes, but we still, for the most part, stay at around industry average. It becomes a little trickier when you have to like give each different experiment its own power analysis, and you need to make like the mental effort of, oh, should this only be two, or should this be a four? It's easier to sometimes just say, let's just do this here, and keep all the experiments consistent on that. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can also take this offline, it will be plenty. Hmm? Uh, I, it should be. If not, I will make sure that it is afterwards. Great. Thank you, everyone.